All right, great. Uh, that's excellent. Right, hi, Nikki. Hello. How are you? I'm really good, actually. I'm really good. Good. Well, that's good to hear. And um, I'm really excited. I've been excited about this. We, we had a little chat be yeah, before um, uh, a few weeks ago, and um, let me just make sure I'm in here. That's it. Um, uh, so I'm really excited about it. There's a lot for us to go and, and unpack together. So thank you for coming and speaking to us. I'm just going to um, give us a, a moment or two just to get people in the room. Uh, say hi when you come in, uh, so I can see you there. Great, I can see people coming. Um, and watch out, everybody. Uh, hi, Zoe. I nice see you. Um, watch out for spammers. They even come in the chat. We've had a bit of a thing in the group tonight, so don't click on any links. Hi, Nikki. Good to see you. Oh, that's great. Everybody's coming in there. Good. So I know some people are probably coming in just to see if we're going to get banned again because of Jack's chat. So sorry about that the other day. That's all been resolved. Uh, we, it wasn't just us, apparently. There's other stuff going on, Nikki. There's other, other groups, I think, that were being affected. Um, oh, hi, Susanna. Great. Brilliant. Hi, Laura. Excellent. Right. So we've got Nikki uh, French with us this evening and um, we caught up at Crufts, didn't we? That's when we mm -hmm. kind of had a chance to chat. And I'd already written, you, uh, already written. <laughs> I'd already read your book, um, Stop Walking Your Dog. And I remember when it came out uh, and um, just uh, a lot of people were raving about it. Uh, but there was a bit of a hoo-ha about it as well, mainly because of the title, I think, Nikki. So it's a very clever, very clever title. So we're going to unpack that in a bit. Uh, and um, we'll make sure that at the end, we've got some links in for the book for those that are interested and, and they can find some other things about you. But as always, Nikki, let's start off with your own story, really. How did you get to write this book and and yeah what was your story yeah or well, i might just start off with how i got into dog training because i'm pretty new to this so um i have only been a dog trainer for four uh four years now and i'd had a 30-year career in sales and marketing property industry i worked on the athletes village for the london 2012 olympics so very oh. very different Ooh. i worked silly hours couldn't even have a dog of my own. I had four cats, including two Siamese over the years, just to try and tide me over. Um, I was an animal mad kid. Um, I literally thought I was Dr. Doolittle in my naivety. <laughs> There's loads of photos of me as a kid, like wrapped around the neck of some wild new forest pony that seemed very happy that I was with them, but left all that behind. And I had a bicycle accident in 2014 and knocked off a, a push bike had a little bit of a brain injury um nothing too severe but it left me in a pressured environment really unable to deal with corporate life anymore and long hours and lots of traveling and it was the start of thinking what am I going to do with the rest of my life and it was a complete epiphany when I had a quick chat with a friend and uh, she said that she was going to get a dog and she was actually thinking about becoming a dog trainer and as soon as those words came out of her mouth, it was there. That's exactly what I was going to do. So literally two days later, resigned. Three months later, started my own business. I started walking dogs. And I specifically took on walking for dogs that couldn't go on pack walks, couldn't go into daycare. You know, they needed one-to-one -one help. And actually some of them needed to not be going on a walk, but they still needed some kind of care. So I would go into their homes and play games with them, training games at home. So I was retraining to be... Um, a, a dog trainer um, and the progression sort of going ahead sort of three years was that I was working with a number of people that had dogs that were really struggling on walks and you know if at least half of their walks were not a pleasant experience at some point in that walk for dog and or caregiver um I was basically saying to people, you need to stop walking your dog. And after I'd said it, I think the third time, this was obviously in lockdown. So I was doing this through Zoom training. The third time I said it, I was like, oh, <laughs> it, that's a book. And I knew it's what I needed to write. I've always wanted to write at least one book. And it, so it, it, it kind of just, it was just there. I don't even feel like I invent, well, I, I didn't invent the concept uh, at all. Obviously ditching the walks is, is, is not my invention for one second um but just the phrase seemed to really just hit home and so that became one of the projects coming out of lockdown um that I really wanted to get that book, book written to help people for lots of different reasons 
And I think that's the genius, isn't it? Because like you say, there is nothing under new under the sun, actually. So it's our personal interpretations of it and, and what we put value on to. But I think putting it on the front cover of a book, even though there's other stuff in the book, it's not just about that part mm-hmm. of it. Uh, it makes a clear statement, I think, about uh, mm-hmm. actually consider this. And so I want to come back to that in a bit because we'll, we'll unpack some of the some of the kind of um, expectations around dog walks and some of the social pressures and what people perceive them to be or not be. Well, we can come on to that in a minute. But I'm interested back to your own story then. Had you been, um, by the way, I like when you say about long hours, I was thinking, how's that working for you now? No, you're a dog for it. <laughs> it's uh, exactly but it's, it's, the same, it's, but it's so <laughs> different. <laughs> Yeah, so different. Yeah, exactly. Without the corporate stress, I think that's the good thing. And you, and you get to see doggies, so that's always good. Yes, yeah. What was your main um, influence around dogs, you know, before you came to do, because I think, did you train with the IMDT? Is that right? Uh, no, I'm absolute dogs. I'm a pro dog trainer. Absolute, absolute dogs. Um, that's right. Yes. Of yeah. Course. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It was one of the main progressive positive ones, which mm. is great. Did you know that you wanted to go down that route? Uh, or did you come across that and then you had to have a shift in perception of dogs? Did you have a view of dogs and dog behavior before you came to look at it professionally? That's such a good question. Um, I did some work experience early on with somebody that was kennel club and it was fine, but it didn't light me up. And there was little elements of it. I don't know why I say with no formal training whatsoever, just didn't feel quite right. Just little elements of it just didn't feel quite right. Um, Just teaching a dog to sit, it just seems a bit random. Why why do you need them to sit? That it just didn't sit right. Um, So, you know, and I'd had a dog growing up as a kid, but that was a very different world and expectations of dogs and how they fitted in within the family home was, was very different. So I think I feel partly I rue the fact that I didn't do this 30 years ago but then also I really like the fact that I've come into this completely shiny and new and I'm able to soak up people like Absolute Dogs like Sarah Fisher like yourself and I'm not clouded by a lot of stuff from the past so I think I've come into it very fresh and very open-minded and also seeing it from the point of view of the majority of caregivers whether they've had dogs before or whether they're first time you know dog people um I think I'm still really close to that mindset so I think I I quite I I have to not wish I'd done a behavioral degree 30 years ago and and just accept the fact that all my knowledge is new and I, I like that about it sometimes I think that's really important you know because let's just say we we sent you back in time and you did that behavioural degree X amount of years ago, you probably wouldn't be having the outlook you have now because you'd have been indoctrinated into something very different. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's a big challenge, I think, for some of our colleagues who mm. have come through certain routes and then, especially because there's there's some quite seismic shifts going on at the moment where, where we really have to, all of us, and myself included, have to keep reevaluating and reappraising what we thought we knew. And, and, uh, and a lot of it is pointing more to being humble enough to just learn from the dog, right? And, and we work from there. So I think there's some advantages coming in fresh. And also, I think it's interesting that your introduction, considering the whole topic today is don't walk your dog, your introduction was as a dog walker, but also recognising that some of those dogs shouldn't be walked. Um, and that's an interesting connection. So you kind of, your route through was through the dog in a way, without those expectations or those kind of weights of, uh judgments that we can have when we've come through a certain way yeah and I think I was very lucky to work with um some people that took me on as a dog walker I was very open I'm learning to be a dog trainer um as I was it was one particular dog um a greyhound cross really big dog beautiful dog lovely dog really dog reactive really people reactive And I would take him out and um, very quickly, I I couldn't walk him any, this is in Twickenham, you know, we live in Twickenham, I couldn't walk him anywhere where I could guarantee I wouldn't see something that would trigger him. And it was obviously so stressful for him, but he was coming out as this barking, lunging, you know, 40 kilo dog. Um, And very quickly, I was saying to the, to to the, um, the caregivers for the dog that actually I think it will be better if 
I do these games at home and I'd been studying with absolute dogs and I'm saying, look, this is what I'd like to do. Are you happy for me to do that instead of walking a dog? And they were like, yeah, yeah, no, that sounds great. And that's exactly what I did. So we ditched walks then. We, I absolutely did stop walking. I was the dog walker that didn't walk the dog. Um, mm. <laughs> I think more dog walkers, you know, it's, it's funny how often I hear from either clients or even dog walkers that get in touch who are like, you know, the dog walkers, they can't do that. Especially the ones who um, they do one-to-ones anyway. They're getting your money. Yeah. So you can have your money by not walking. You can get your money by sitting in the nice warm house and playing games and doing the confidence building stuff and uh, free work or whatever it is that you might approach. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah. So I think I was very lucky to have some open-minded clients and and they actually then went on to become training clients as my training business started to develop, which yeah. was really lovely. Mm. That's interesting. I think it's it's nice. It's it's a bit different, really, um, I have to say, Nikki, because, you know, often uh, when I speak to people and we hear their origin story, there is that one dog that, that they have to learn from, or there is that person that they meet, if they're fishers, you know, um, to Rugas or whoever it is that they've kind of come across. Um, but this is you just coming in, like, say, fresh. And I, and I think that's a really lovely thing. I think it's something to celebrate. Mm. um you know uh we shouldn't apologize for being new uh and in fact there's a lot of there's a lot of um richness to be taken from fresh eyes right you can just kind of see the value in things mm. i would say that my dog has also taught me a huge amount so i started the business in march 19 um i started looking for a dog i wanted a rescue dog i wanted a young rescue dog that could work with me in the business um and we found bodie at Battersea cats and dogs home in july uh, of 19 and he was an eight month old collie lurcher cross he'd been in and out of Battersea twice um for nothing more than just an awful lot of overexcitement. Mm. Um, and he's got a very collie brain on him but he has the back end of a greyhound so he can run (laughs) so he has this collie brain he'll sometimes do the outrun sometimes it's just the straight run and for the first year I was like oh gosh (laughs) I don't know that I have the skills to help him in the way that I know he needs but we grew together Um, So I did learn a huge amount. And very quickly, I realized that two to three walks a day was absolutely not what he needed. You know, he would get very over aroused. He would want to meet every dog, meet every person. But he'd he'd come across as really friendly, but there was a real franticness about it. He just didn't know what to do with all the emotions that he had. Um, so fairly quickly, I adopted the right, well, we'll do one walk a day and then it's short bursts of games at home and other activities. And as soon as we started doing that, and even to this day, he it's once in a blue moon, he'll get two walks in a day. He's so much calmer, so, so much calmer. So, you know, he he did teach me an awful lot in terms of that first hand. It's all very well me saying to somebody, oh, you need to stop walking your dog, do this instead. Yes but living with it and seeing the real implications. You know, I know in the evenings when he used to be really hard work, really hard work, that he is so much better at settling down, so much easier um, to live with. Um, And he's a happier dog, you know. People used to think he was that smiley, panty dog, but you know inside it's not coming from a, a happy, relaxed, emotional state. So, yeah. Well, that's interesting because I think one of the big responses, stress responses that get overlooked is that fun, fool around kind of, you know, um, fun appeasement response that we that we often see and it can get overlooked, of course. And we think the yeah. dog loves everybody. You know? yeah. And in fact, they're just like, this is too much. I'm just going to do all this kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, living with I've got three dogs, two of them are Labradors. You, you see that uh, for sure. And um, uh, I want us to build up to start really thinking about the power of um, looking at walks and what they are and what they're not. And and this kind of notion that sometimes maybe not walking is is a better option. And especially thinking about those dogs who we traditionally think need lots of exercise Mm -hmm. and they need to be doing more stuff where actually the answer is often to do less. And we're going to kind Mm -hmm. of come around to that in in a moment. But it's Mm -hmm. interesting what you said there about the dog that you've got there. And I remember even with, with myself, 
uh, Arthur, who's my old boy now, so he's 12, <clears throat> when he was young, he was, he really struggled with everything in life, actually. And I remember literally being in tears with my late mother. She's not with us anymore. So it was just my mother and I and, and Arthur. Uh, and I remember saying to her, you know, I can't do this. And I'm supposed to be, this is quite early on. I've been maybe practicing for a couple of years with clients. And he was this dog and I was really struggling with it. And it was mom who had to say to me, stop trying to fix him, which is odd because we, th we say to ourselves, oh, we don't look at quick fixes. But actually, we feel under pressure to sometimes that we somehow have to do something. And it was my mom that gave me permission with Arthur to not do anything, do less with him. And, and sometimes we need to hear that from somewhere else, don't we? I think even as yeah. professionals, I think, because there's, there's a lot of pressure on us. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was interesting that you, that you kind of learn that from him, actually. You know, that that's what he was trying to let you know. I need to do some things a little bit differently. Yeah. When, when you did the, uh, so with, with Absolute Dogs and people who don't know about Absolute Dogs, um, there's a big kind of fun game element to the Absolute Dogs approach, isn't there, which is about yeah. trying to kind of get that brain into a play style outlook to do learning through. Is that, would that be a fair way of yeah, judging it? Absolutely. So it should be, you know, maximum three minutes for a game and it may even be 30 seconds for a game and it should just be fun learning, but really targeted at whatever it is that the dog is lacking, whether it's confidence, whether it's that sense of optimism, whether it's calmness, you know, you, uh, whether it's dogs, whether it's, you know, kids, whether it's humans, if we're having fun, we are open to the experience and we're going to learn and we're going to retain that information. So if you compare that with dog and human having fun, A, they're going to want to keep doing it and B, that learning is really important. So, you know, that's not the kind of learning that you can do when you're in the middle of a stressful situation. You need yeah. to take that out of the stressful walk and you need to do it in the space where all those stresses are not around as much as you can. And if you're doing that kind of game approach, what do you look at? What feedback do you look at to see that the dog is learning to cope better, feeling more confident, uh, the kind of kind of metrics that you were talking about there, um, and uh, and not just kind of getting into the game? Or what, what yeah. do you look at? What do you look for beyond that? How do, how does that work out? I think for me, sort of big indicators are, you know, if a dog is relatively foody, if they are enjoying the game. And, it, and there is food rewards, whether they're chasing the food down or they're receiving the, the, the food for coming back or it's being delivered in some way, catch, scatter, whatever. If they are a foodie dog and they're enjoying the food, um, I think it's a really good litmus test that as soon as you go to a slightly different place, if all of a sudden that food is not being eaten in the same way, you know, some dogs will just get rid of it as quickly as they can and it'll go down. Um, but it's a very different experience than oh, I'm, I'm having the piece of chicken. I'm having, you know, whatever it is. Um, some dogs will just literally, oh, it's, it's not going in. And so I think if, if it's food or if it's toys or if it's praise, if it's, it's the, if it's a reward mechanism that they generally respond well to when you're in a situation where that no longer works, then, you know, they don't have the skills in that situation or or the game isn't right for them or that, you know, the pressure might be too much for them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that for me is a, a big test. And it can be as I mean, I've, I've worked with people in their homes where they can play a game in the front room. They really struggle out on walks. And when we've broken it right down, the game that they love playing in the in the living room, even in the hallway closer to the door is enough for them to be like, I, I can't remember this in the game or I don't particularly want this piece of food or I'm just bolting it just to get it out. You know, it can be that significant of mm. breaking it down, of going, oh, I enjoy the food and we're having fun here. No, it's not working for me. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing for using because uh, play is cool. I, I use play myself. And um, uh, for me, it's about how do we improve that sensory integration process, especially when the dog is around things that normally are kind of um, overstimulating or get that nervous system elevated quite quickly. And I think, uh, you know, whether it's dogs engaging in nose work, um, free work, play, it can be a great way for that dog to be in a different kind of neurobiological, neurochemical state to be exposed or bear witness to the things that they can actually process better um, and feel more comfortable with rather than having that kind of instant nervous system response. I think that's an important thing. Great. Okay, that's good. So let's take, let's get to the nitty gritty then. Really, I think. Um, uh, so when we think about not walking 
dogs uh, or we give the advice that we need to kind of think about stop walking a dog if we look at it from the human end of the leaf first what are the challenges do you think for people because some people you know you, when we're talking off air you, you use the expression of giving permission mm. you can see the instant relief in people sometimes you're like and they think phew I don't have to take my dog down the beach every day then because it's really stressful for me and I don't want to do it um, but you equally get people who are they're quite reluctant to um, so uh, tell us a little bit about the human side of things for you and about what you come across and the and the challenges that you have and some of the reasons why you think people are reluctant to think about doing less especially around walking yeah I think it starts with this misconception this belief system that if you have a dog you need to walk it two one two three times a day like you 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 have a dog you must walk your dog and of course they have exercise need they have physical needs they have mental needs of course they do but I think it is just the perception of you have a dog and this is what you do you need to fit in with this mold and this is all that you can you can do regardless of 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 what happens and I think it's so embedded in us that I I you know I've had people that have, have have seen the book or read the book and they've messaged me to say it felt wrong what I was doing it felt wrong. I felt stressed. I could see the dog was stressed, but I didn't think it was an option. I didn't think I couldn't walk my dog. I didn't think there were other things that I could do instead. And the social pressure from from partners, from immediate family, from friends, that when they were having conversations, it just didn't, it just felt like they were, you know, social pariahs for even thinking Well, that would be cruel. Um, And especially for for dogs that are higher drive, you know, working collies, working cockers, working Labradors, you know, the breeds that you think, God, no, they need to be out walking for two, three, four hours a day. The people that were really struggling, that that relief when you say, no, there, there is other things that you can do instead. And it might be walk less it might be take a a break from walks for a while and replace the activities but I think that it's just so deep-seated in us and for most dogs absolutely it's the right thing to do but for some it isn't and just starting conversations and starting to help spread that awareness that is growing within certainly the professional community that it's okay to do something else if it really doesn't feel right for them for whatever reason, because there is so much else that people can do. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, this is this comes back to this thing about looking at the dog in front of us and then looking at their needs. And um, we'll come on to the doggies in a minute. Keep, keep, keeping on the humans, I think also there's um, there's a lot, a lot of lifestyle expectations when people get a dog. Mm. You know, there's, a, there's the expression Lassie syndrome, which is... Uh, for the younger or, or those the younger people in the audience, uh, Lassie was a kind of a, a movie dog who just seemed to know what the humans wanted, and they kind of read Lassie's mind and everything it was great. Uh, so Lassie syndrome is about us kind of expecting that dog, that yeah. dog we can just take to the pub with us, um, lie under the table, be good, and go and walk on the beach and run around the fields with loads of doggy friends. And I think that comes into this thing. It's funny how many people have said to me, colleagues wise. Yeah, but I got the dog so I could go walking. And then you say, well, can you go walking what, by yourself? And, and, and it's really hard for them to think about maybe yeah. doing some of that stuff without the dog. And for some people, actually, uh, their own emotional experience is that they need the dog or they, they need that extra support because they would find navigating the social environment challenging for themselves as well. So if you end up with somebody who has those challenges, who then adopts a dog with similar challenges, it's it's a, it's a tough call, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. And I absolutely see that of, of um, people that have got a dog because they want to get they want to get themselves out of the house. And the concept of leaving a dog at home and going for a walk without their dog is is alien for, for so many reasons, even if they, you know, even if it actually probably could be beneficial for the dog to have a little bit of alone time. Um, I think they, they really, really struggle with that. Um, 
um, oh, I've just lost my thread. You'll have to forgive me. It's one of the things that's left over from the bike accident. I'm really good at losing my thread partway through. <laughs> Well, that's okay. At least you have a, a, a good excuse for yours. I, I just, I <laughs> and just, I'm over 50. Uh, that there's there's two. <laughs> well, that's a, so am I actually. So we're both over 50. So we can, we can use that one. Um, yeah. So we were talking about kind of the, the uh, lifestyle connections, the lifestyle expectations with with walking with dogs, and but also how some people, you know, uh, they do find it hard to go out. You know, uh, I've got a client I was working with recently who's uh, she's a widow. She found it very hard to go out without her husband. So she got a dog, uh, rescued this dog to kind of go out more. But the dog struggles with that at the moment. Um, and so it's extra tough, I think. And and it, we've got to be careful, I think, as practitioners to be asking too much of the human sometimes, not, 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 not as well as the dog, you know, about what they do or what they don't do. Mm. I think, and coming back, yes, coming back to the original question, um, I think that there is that perception with some people that they are going, I think it's that lack of realisation of what a dog entails and that thinking that they're going to have a biddable creature that, you know, you, the, the dog should just want to do what you want to do that they should just want to do whatever it is that fits in with your life and and, and I do see that and you know these are these are people that they love their dog but that perception of what is a realistic expectation of what an animal can do within a modern environment that is not what they are bred for really um that yeah, I think it catches a lot of people off guard. And I think it's definitely something that I'm seeing even more of now with sort of the lockdown dogs that are sort of two and a half, three years old now, um, that I think that people are really struggling to get their head around what the real needs of the dog are. And I think that's a bit of a, a shock when you start having conversations about what we need to do to try and get dogs and humans into a happier, more harmonious relationship. And that's the key, isn't it? Because there's multiple nervous systems at play here. Um, you know, quite often when we turn up, you and I, to, to seek caregivers, there's at least one human and at least one dog. So you've got at least two nervous systems there both with their own needs and their own needs for safety and all these kind of things that we think about. Um, uh, but before we come on to the dogs specifically uh, and look at that, because there's a lot of stuff we can talk about there about dogs, I think. Uh, when we think about the walks themselves, so we thought about a little bit about the human side of things. And by the way, before we move on from humans, um, how do you navigate then those clients who are a bit more reticent, a little bit more reluctant to think about you know they really feel that pressure to think well I must take my dog out for a walk I have to do that yeah so I think it very much depends on the individual sometimes it is you know say say it really does need to but the walks need to stop in an ideal world the walks would stop but they're not the human is just not ready just not ready so we start maybe reducing it and then we say right let's keep a diary let's make observations what's changing are you seeing anything working better um is it getting worse i've not seen it get worse <laughs> um, so you can kind of start leading in okay well we've done that right well let's see if we can take that on you know do you like where you're at right now or would you like to this progress to carry on so you can kind of lead them into it um some people i think it just takes a bit of time and i think that's where the book's been so useful because um I know quite quite a few trainers that if they are coming up against clients that are very much like, no, I couldn't do that. When they say, yeah, but someone's written a book about it, then they kind of go, oh, or if they're having trouble getting someone within the family or friend network, you know, a direct influence on board, they can say, look, no, somebody's written a book about it. It can kind of help open that door a little, a little bit more. Um, so. I, I guess I'm attracting people that are semi bought into it. If they found the book or they've seen something online about me, they're kind of coming to, and some people are just writing to me and contacting me and just saying, 
it, it's like you wrote the book for me. <laughs> um, right. What, what, do, what do I need to do more? Because obviously it's not just stop walking your dog. It's then reintroduction. And there's so much more to it than that. But so I think I'm slightly fortunate now that I'm attracting people that are already like, yes, I get it. This is what I need to do. But I think just showing them a little bit, you know, if they're walking them three times a day, just swap one of those walks out for something else. And let's do these things and see how it progresses. And of course, Stop Walking Your Dog as, as a book. We also have Stop Walking Your Dog Day. We, we just missed that. Um, uh, I was going to have you on uh, for that, actually, but I got COVID. So, there you go. Um, uh, so I think that helps to kind of highlight that for people, just make them think, well, and also it doesn't have to be, it depends, every dog's different, of course, and every case is different. Uh, but, you know, we have deliberate down days mm -hmm. where we just don't put any expectation on ourselves, any kind of normal rituals around walks go out the window. And even just doing that and, and even looking at that dog, uh, I invite my clients to look at the dog over a seven day cycle. because I think mm -hmm. the nervous system is more representative that way. Um, so uh, like you say, when we first meet them, seven days, pretty guaranteed two walks a day. Yeah. Uh, and walking's great, right? Going out for walks is lovely. We all find it very healthy. It's a good way to ground ourselves. But it wouldn't be nice if you were walking through a riot or you were walking through a war field or something and that's potentially how some of these dogs might perceive what they're walking through Absolutely. so even having a break some days out of that seven mm. or even thinking about the different types of walks so um a lot of my clients they use like industrial estates out of hours mm. or weekends because it's a walk and it's hard to get to see anything so it's just being creative about the walks as well isn't it it doesn't have to be do it or don't do it it's just about thinking about the places that you're going to and uh, the times of day you might be going and what you're more yeah. likely to encounter. And, and what you talked about there regarding having a diary, keeping data is so good because evidence bases for them. Um, not only can they see, actually, do you know what? We went on a nice moochie walk on the moors today. We didn't see much in it. Interesting rover really settled well tonight. Or we were in this place and this, this and this happened. And then I really saw that my dog was struggling. It gives them a chance to unpick it. Yeah. Evidence base it. Yeah, exactly that. And, you know, I mean, with, with our dog, sometimes it might be quite a short walk. It might be some games before he goes out, a short walk, then some games when we come back. It won't necessarily be, you know, a full length walk or it might be drive somewhere, take a nice long lasting chew with us, get out the car, sit somewhere, let him have the chew, let him watch the world go by get back in the car, go, but, you know, go. So he's had, he's been out. Um, it's, you know, we maybe didn't do, I think most people think you need to do a proper big circuit and a big loop, but you know, it can be all sorts of different experiences. It might just be for some dogs going out somewhere, sitting in a quiet car park, as you say, windows open, watching a little bit of the world go by perhaps with, 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 you know, a bit of a chew or something like that. And then mm. back home again, it really doesn't need to be this sort of traditional concept of a walk. And that's really great. I love that. Uh, I love that a lot, Nikki. And I think thinking outside the box is, is really helpful. You know, if you've got a dog who struggles to navigate the social environment around other dogs, um, but you want to build up some confidence with the work you're doing and giving them chance to feel they have more time to process and that kind of thing. I quite often uh, get my clients to walk around the big supermarket car parks, for example, and things like that, because you're not going to see many dogs there, but they yeah. get the chance to be able to process the environment and work around things. And, and, uh, and being out in the environment and actually just stopping and just processing like you just described there is, un is underrated. It can be really powerful, can't it, actually, just to let that nervous system come to rest a little bit and actually take on information. Yeah. And also, you know, because all of this applies for me uh, primarily because of Bodhi, but just as much for the dogs that are really overexcitable, as well as those that are deemed reactive or have some kind of, you know, more negative, uh, more overt reaction because for Bodhi to sit and watch the world go by and not think that every dog and human, every dog and human needs some kind of interest, um, for him it's massive. You know, it's a massive mm. skill. So for the overexcitable dogs, that that for me is a, a a real game changer. So let's talk about the doggies then. We, we, we've um, we thought a little bit about the human side of things and. Um, um... And uh, Claire just shared with us in the group about um, how stressful it is for, for both ends of the leash. So thanks for sharing that, Claire. I think, I think that's important, of course, because, um, you know, you end up with just two nervous systems that are just waiting to react, in inverted commas. Yeah. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the different types of walks, and it's about trying to be creative there and, and thinking about the different types of walks. And what they might look like. like, of course, we've got a big 
uh, surge now in the number of private hire fields. We've got quite a few local to me now, which are brilliant. They're just really good spaces. Uh, and you can book them by the half hour or the hour. So, you know, it's, it's not too overly um, uh, restrictive financially, uh, that kind of thing. Let's just think about dogs then. Let's just go through this because there's so many different aspects here for us to think about why a dog might benefit from less walks, shorter walks, no walks. Let's just yeah. think about some of the uh, different types of dogs, shall we? Some of the different kind of categories um, far away. Yeah, so reactivity is obviously the biggest, most obvious one. You know, a dog that is struggling around other dogs or other people, or it might be noises, you know, that whole category of they do not have all the skills they need to feel calm and relaxed in an, in whatever kind of environment that they are in. And, you know, I, I know people that live in the country and they walk at 5 a.m. and they're desperately trying to avoid anything, but invariably there will be a bird scare that goes off in the distance and it can be enough to have a massive reaction. So I think reactive reactivity is the ma a massive one. Another one I think for me is like the 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 illness, the aging, the surgery, any kind of restricted exercise, some kind of crate rest, not being able to go as far, not being able to do as much as they used to be able to do. Um, having that whole extra toolkit of stuff that you can do that can still give the dog the most full and enriched life that it is able to have in you know whatever capacity that looks like um that i think is 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 a really big category too that's an important one to remember i think because uh it's, it's quite sad really i think because we live down on the beach here and Devon and uh, everybody flocks down to the beach, you know, when the when the months your dogs are out on the beach. So over the years, you know, we look through our kind of um, uh, living room window or the office window where we can see people. And over the years, you see the dogs grow old mm. and you literally see the dogs coming down, trying down, can't wait to get to the beach. And then almost kind of being dragged down to the beach and, and still having the same walk because we're such... Um, we're real ones for routine, aren't we? <clears throat> uh, so you know, I take my dog out at nine o'clock in the morning, we go for a good hour's walk and then we come home and then I then I watch the telly, whatever it is that we do. Yeah. And um, for many of these dogs, you know, the hour itself might not be the problem. The hour every day becomes a problem. Mm. Yeah, I see it around on, you know, the streets around here of that, that stiff waddling and I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's too much. It's too much for them. Yeah, massive. And, and I think sometimes the one, the people with uh, dogs who are a bit older or might have, um, you know, I'm an advisor with canine arthritis management. So we talk about this a lot at CAM. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, another thing that's very hard for people to uh, accept, actually, or even acknowledge. They might be aware of it. They might recognize that the dog's a bit slower or they're a bit lame or whatever. But it's a tough thing, isn't it, when dogs get to that age, I think. And and. They do need that external person to say, well, maybe just Rover needs less of a walk today or, or, or has a day off. Yeah. And yeah. And, and it's, if you live with anything day in, day out, you you don't see the changes um, as much. But yeah, I think there is that element of, of denial and, and also it's that emotional pressure of their thinking, well, the walk is for the dog and they don't want to. They want to they don't want to reduce their pleasure, whereas they could be probably increasing the ple pleasure by doing it less and, and doing some other dental activities that are, you know, scenting based or whatever um, at home or taking them part of the way and then doing the sit and sit and watch and watch the world go by or whatever, you know, doing other things to change, change the balance from just being a bit of a marathon that's, um, you know, really hard going for them. And that brings us into the <clears throat> realm of adaptations, I think, because, um, again, when people think about these things, they tend to think in quite a binary way often, which is either do it or don't do it. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's adaptations you can make, you know, uh, say different places, different paces, um, uh, how the walk looks, what you do. I love the advent of the um, dog trolleys and things, Nikki, mm -hmm. you know, the dog prams and the buggies yeah. and stuff. Uh, I used to think, like and maybe others did, when I first saw one, I thought, well, that's a bit odd. But now I think, isn't it a wonderful thing? Because that yeah. dog is physically not walking, but they're enjoying the experience of being out. 
Yeah, still getting to sniff everything, still getting to see everything. Yeah, I think they're wonderful. I think they're absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And uh, one of our neighbours, uh, the dog's not with us sadly anymore, but uh, they used to go over to a place called, um, um, I can't remember what's called now, but, but it's, it's a lovely space and it overlooks a place called Thatcher's Rock and it's really beautiful and, and it's, it's a really good place to go. And they always used to go up there, they always used to walk up to there, come home again. And over the years, they were really on it about how their dog was getting older and, and a little bit less, yeah, a little bit more infirm. And they made those adaptations until eventually they'd literally... Even though it wasn't very far, in the car, drive up there, out the car, sit on the bench together, have a little sniff, have a little mooch and come home. And that's quite beautiful, isn't it? And I think it's it's, it's just that adaptation over time. Yeah, I think that's lovely. And then, you know, then you've got things like weather extremes, you know, wherever you are in the world. I, I, I just see too many people out with their dogs when it is too hot to be comfortable for them. Mm. Um, or it's too cold and people think no no the dogs need to get out it's still that fixed mindset of we must do this no matter what and yeah just changing changing that emphasis to making sure it is comfortable and appropriate for the dog <clears throat> so reactive dogs in inverted commas uh for sure because obviously they're struggling to navigate something and I think uh, you and I and, and our colleagues working with with the clients to dial that back to a point where that nervous system can get a bit of a break and then really trying to learn what is it about navigating that environment that is particularly difficult for you and, and how do we help you to navigate that? <clears throat> uh, going back to the um, using the industrial states and that kind of thing, it's a great way to start introducing dogs to a little bit more and a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, if you think outside the box, you don't have to necessarily go from nothing to something you can layer them in it's a principle called sensory mapping mm -hmm. where we're just letting that brain map that okay this is okay for me and then map that and map that uh, and then you get get clearer signs of where the overwhelmness comes from uh, as you move through uh, and of course older dogs talked about that the infirm dogs another one for me is um is the very young dogs um yeah. and uh so molly uh our dog is a good example there and uh, every dog's different, of course, but with Molly, she really struggled to say we live on a beach, which is great, but she never saw that beach until she was 11, 12 months old because she just couldn't deal with it. It was too much yeah. for her. And and uh, there's a lot of inadverted commas damage done by caregivers just thinking, I'm going to take the dog out and the dog's going to be okay. And they're young and they look like they're loving it all. We talked earlier about that fun appeasement response, which might seem that they love everybody, but they're struggling to cope with it. Um, and it's just, it can become quite overwhelming, the environment. And those walks actually when we think we need to be giving them longer walks when they're younger and more fit or all these kind of things, emotionally and socially, even though they can deal with it physically, they're struggling with it. Yeah. And I think it's, there's, there's an element of um, desperation. Is that the right word of people that have got a puppy and they're going through, you know, the first tough few months and they've they've you know there's all the teething and that there's the high energy and and they're I think they're desperate to get this energy channeled into something and you know they just think well yes getting the dog getting the dog out and getting them walked and you know that's going to tire them out they're going to exhaust themselves and then they're going to fall asleep um so it's sort of as soon as they can as soon as the immunization is all sorted get a lead on them, let's get them out and let's see if we can just get them tired because that will help them through it. And of course, the reality is that's that's the exact opposite. Mm. <laughs> and the, and the you know, the walks are just chaotic and lead chewing and eating all the stones and all the sticks and trying to jump up at everybody. And, you know, it just the puppy doesn't have the skills to go for a walk. But again, it's this mentality of you need to start walking them. You need to get them out. You need to get them out. You need to get them walking. You need to have their five minutes per whatever. And and out there. Oh, there's my own dog barking at something out the front. There we go. <laughs> I never get through an hour's Zoom without something. No, well, I'm surprised I have. We've got, I've got six dogs here at the moment, so I'm surprised myself. <laughs> and I think that's really important. I love what you said there, Nikki. And that's such an important point. And it's one that people don't think about, I think, because they go out with a mindset of expecting obedience and compliance from the young dog got to walk to heel, can't pull on the lead, you know, all these kind of expectations, must sit at the curb, you know, asking loads of stuff for a dog who's already like, whoa, but the environment's already big. Or they go out to deliberately tire the dog. Mm -hmm. So this is where the ball comes out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, what we have to remember is from a, from a mother nature point of view, if you want to use that term, um, 
uh, one of the most important things we have to learn through adolescence specifically is how do we how we self-regulate. It's not innate. We have to learn that over time. Uh, and um, a lot of these young dogs, they don't get those experiences either because their nervous system's already elevated anyway because they're struggling to cope. They're not finding the ability to process, to engage, or to exit on their terms. Those three really important parts. Uh, or um, uh, they're not getting the chance to process properly anyway because they're chasing a ball, for example. Yeah. Um, or they're in a very highly elevated state, or they're being expected to do all the command stuff. Mm. So again, when you think about that dog who's, who's young and just wants to sniff and process and explore and, and even dysregulate, but in a safe way, there's so many restrictions on them, isn't there? Uh, and I so that's a really important part about how we must think about what the walks look like for those juvenile adolescent dogs. Yeah. Or even it's not about the walks. It's about what exposure they have to mm. the outside world. And if that means pop them in the car, drive to the back of the shopping centre car park and sit with the windows open and watch the world go by. That's a great experience. They get to hear a rattling trolley. They get to see people coming and going that are not interacting with them. Um, you know, they can have wonderful socialisation experiences without ever actually being on lead and you know, running crazily around a park at all. There's this, I mean, yes, you know, yes, they need feet on grass and so on. But, you know, there are so many other elements to it that you can do with your puppy uh, and your young adolescent dog to show them there are lots of different in ways to interact with the world. And it doesn't mm. necessarily mean it's just a, a free for all. <clears throat> and if we think about the uh, the three most important things about feeling safe, which is the ability to process, uh, the ability to engage on your terms and the ability to know you have an exit. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And I think uh, what we miss in education, I think for puppy and adolescent dog owners is the power of being able to um, think about just as much about the environmental changes that we look at as much as the things that you introduce the dog to and the different things that you might want to do. So again, looking at that dog over a seven day cycle and thinking right today, we're going to do this type of thing. And mm -hmm. the next day that. But constantly getting the feedback from the dog, as I say with Molly, um, the, uh, we kept a really quiet environments in those early months because she was so sensitive. Mm -hmm. We just wanted her to know that she could mooch around and she could process. There wasn't going to be much going on. Um, uh, and that was really valuable for her, really valuable for her. But I think a lot of the general public with this notion of um, socialising, they, they think it's the kind of got to meet loads of stuff, got to do loads of stuff, as though the brain is OK to take all that in at that point. And actually, for some dogs, it isn't. It's uh, it's the opposite. Yeah, I think that the importance of fewer positive experiences just so 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 important that a lot of people you know i think there's still this thinking of there's a checklist of 100 things and if i haven't mm. exposed them to all of these things by a certain age or hell's going to break loose but within that 100 things five of them are probably at least going to be scaring if not much worse so you know let's reduce that list down and um make sure that they're positive experience not overwhelming I think the other thing that I see quite often is um, breaking things right down. So very early on, instead of, um, you know, when the harness comes out, the harness doesn't mean crazy excitement because we're running out of the door. Or in the case of some dogs, oh, I'm going to run away because actually I associate mm. that harness with going to a place that often I get a bit scared um you know you've got combinations of people just sort of having to hold the dog to get the harness in because mm. they think they have to get out the front door no matter what whereas when you start breaking it right down and go right let's just play some hand touch games target the harness can you pop your nose through the harness nothing happens it might go on it might not harness might not go might go on and we might not even go out and you know pairing it right back down to some really really basic skills rather than just thinking got to get the harness on no matter what so that we can get out the front door and I you know I did I see that a lot you know and I, it's completely understandable why that's what that's what a lot of people still think um but it's yeah. so powerful that bit that you just said there because I think when, when we think about dogs who the clients might tell us the presentation is the dog doesn't like the harness there's so many component parts about 
it might not be able like I say about the harness per se it's about what that represents and what happens next and then it can be very confusing or or, or difficult to see for the caregiver because they think well when the dog goes out they love it mm -hmm. the dog's now in a fizzy state and they're going to have to engage with it so um yeah. so it's a theme here isn't it when Nikki we were almost everything you've said uh and that is about the kind of power of just slowing things down mm -hmm. And just trying to see which are the prickly bits, which are the fizzy bits, which are the copy bits. That's good grammar, I don't know. But you know what I'm trying to say. I think I think that it is that key, and that includes the walks. I think yeah. the walks are not some arbitrary task that have to happen in a certain way. There's no expectations there. We can slow those down too, including about not even doing them. Hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. I've not even looked at it like that. But yeah, absolutely. I'm a massive fan of breaking things down. And I think the more you can put into those really minuscule little foundation layers, the wider you can make that foundation, the quicker dogs progress. You know, I saw a client only today and it was like, oh, the ironing board is really scary for them. Look, when I get it out, the dog is scared. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> can you even be in the room where the cupboard is, where the, where, where, where the ironing board is, you know, can we work within that? And, and just the, yeah, working on the, 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 the smallest component parts for every part of things and then yeah if, if that works then you build and if it doesn't you need to step it right back mm. and just keep go slow to go quick I think isn't it always and that comes back to those three foundational things processing engagement and exit once the dog's in a bit in, in a position that they can actually process it well even if it's a small little bit of it mm -hmm. and that they can choose to engage how they engage with that environment and then the exit then things start to build from there and Going back to something you said about puppies, about how a lot of people feel they've got to meet loads of people, got to meet men with beards, got to meet men with sticks, got all those kind of things. Um, I think there's something more fundamental underneath that that the dog really needs to learn. And that is that they're safe, that they have a return to safety, which is the caregiver, and that they have the time to do that processing, engagement and exit options. And that's all we did with Molly, actually, because she was so sensitive when she came, she didn't meet much at all. So we did everything against the book, really. And I'm not saying every dog's like Molly. This is, I always say this because it's Molly's story, that's all. But for her, she learned those fundamental things. So when she did meet more stuff, she knew, do you know, I'm not so sure about this, but I do have time to process it. Or if I'm unsure, I'll go and find my dad and we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think they're important life lessons, aren't they? Yeah. And, I, and, and as you say, it's like go and find your dad. So the most important part of that is the bond, the relationship between dog and human or dog and humans, and that, um, you know, helping people think my dog doesn't need to have a mass of doggy friends. It absolutely needs to trust and know that I've got their back no matter what. And, and the bond with me, you know, the most important bond that, that Bodhi has is with myself and my boyfriend. And yeah. You know, he doesn't need to be friends with every dog and friends with every person. Um, I'd rather he's just got a nice level of me. You know, me, that's the best result, uh, re response a dog can have is just kind of indifference. Like, not bothered either way. It's just there. It's not really not, not too bothered. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest gifts of the of this new, well, I say new, is not, not new as such, um, but uh, how we're looking at things, especially in Dog Centre Care as a group, uh, and, the, and the way that Linda and, and Turid Rugas and Sarah Fisher and um, uh, Sindor, Sindor Pangal and Saujania with her gentle parenting and many others. Um, I think it's an important message to get to caregivers that actually the training is help is important you know, to do teaching, to teach a dog that vocabulary and, and all the things. But it is less important, actually, than creating that secure attachment. And that has to come by allowing that dog to be able to dysregulate safely with you as a return to safety, to be able to communicate to you and not be constantly judged for that's bad, that's wrong, that's bad, that's wrong. And also to have a chance to give some feedback, even when you're training. Because if we're just thinking about, okay, I've asked the dog to do something, they're not going to do it, so I'm going to change how I do it or ramp up the reinforcer or whatever it is we might think about. We're not giving an option for that dog to say, actually, I can't do this right now. Uh, and that starts to affect a bond, I think, over time, if you can't communicate that need. Mm. I think what you're doing is you're just trying to set up a situation where the dog is able to better make a natural you know make a natural choice but that's a good choice in our eyes in terms of mm. what our expectations are of what's acceptable and appropriate you know if you 
if you set them up in that way, they're going to make a, a better choice in, in our sort of our eyes of what, what we want a dog to be. Mm. Sure. Um, we're talking about slowing things down and uh, one might, well, God, we're nearly at the end here, which is, uh, I've got so much more I want to talk to you about. But, um, perhaps get you back. We can, we can pick on one bit because there's a, it, all these little bits, Nikki, we could probably kind of go into quite a rabbit hole on them. But uh, you and I both work a lot with with what we might class as, some people might class as the kind of high drive, high energy dogs, you know, uh, you working line dogs and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and I think sometimes the caregivers, just like with young dogs, can adopt an approach of thinking, I need to do more with this dog. I need to do more big stuff. And of course, these dogs can do fast. They can do quick really easily. Yeah, they don't need any extra help with that. They can do fizzy really easily. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, the answer's always been to do less. Yeah, actually, uh, and that's a big thing to invite people to do with these dogs. But number of times we've done a nice slow moochy walk somewhere, uh, long line maybe whatever it is we're using, and then you get that photo of that really conked out collie, but in a nice way, not because they're yeah. exhausted. It's just because they've had a nice day processing and they've had a chance just to practice slowing down a bit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. I, I There was um, one of the first people that I said to um, stop walking their dog is actually the little mini case study that's in the book. And um, a wonderful lady called Gail, who won't mind me talking about it. She, she loves sharing her story now. She, experienced collie owner, um, had Ella. Um, and it, it was, she was about probably about 18 months old when we'd had a number of conversations about you need to do less. You need to stop walking your dog. And Ella was terrified of any kind of noises. Um, she would pull frantically towards things, away from things. She'd pancake down to the floor if there was any kind of noise, just a, like a slight rumble of truck in the background would be enough to just send her, send her into just absolute meltdown. There was a number of times where the husband had to just come and literally scoop the dog up to carry her home, like she was completely stuck. Um, and she was just in a constant emotional stress state. But even at home, even the TV, animals on the TV, even that, you know, wasn't a relaxing environment. And she did stop walking her dog altogether for more than two months. And she just thought that was not going to work. But she was like, no, I need to do something. She was desperate enough uh, and wanted to try it. And it was just short game sessions at home in the garden after a period of time, she started playing some of the games. She had a little grassy alleyway out back of the garden, started playing them there, grew little by little by little. Um, you know, the dog previously couldn't take any food outside of the house at all, couldn't eat outside the house. And then, you know, we're sort of another year and a half down the line. So she's just over three now. And she's now posting up photos in my membership where the dog is going on family holidays, they're going to the pub, they go to the, you know, they to go out in the caravan. And the dog that would not explore anywhere is got, you know, she's like next to sculpture on the beach. And yeah, and just is having a lovely life. And just every photo I see, it looks like a different dog, because previously, the tension in the dog's face versus this happy relaxed calm nicely tired as you say and before it was you know the advice she was getting was do more do more she, mm. she you know you've just you've got to exhaust her to the point that she just sort of gives into it and and you know it was just making things worse and, and just seeing it firsthand um it makes me really emotional when I see the photos coming up. Um, but, you know, if, if if dogs that are that ready to work can can ditch walks and do things completely differently, then, you know, every dog can, if they need to, make some kind of significant changes like that. So, Yeah, and it's a great, uh, it's a great case that you have in the book. <clears throat> and uh, what's good about the book as well, Nikki, is it's... Um... It's instructional, but it's also got a, a kind of storytelling narrative. I, I think it's kind of written as you speak, actually hearing you talk. You can, you can, you can, I have a fairly yeah. simple brain, so it comes out as I speak. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. And I think one thing to, I think I really want to stress to everybody, you know, we share these case studies and we, we share some of our stories, but every every dog is different. And, um, you know, some dogs 
may always struggle to navigate the world around them mm -hmm. for, for a number of reasons. And, and it's not because they're broken or, or they're defective. Uh, it's just because that they, they have the, their own part of their story that, uh, you know, can be hard to work out sometimes. I think it's very, it's very challenging to. And um, uh, I think, like you say, the thing about a train more, train more narrative, which is what some people can put across, is that when you have those dogs, uh, the only outcome can be one of guilt, shame and, and blame because either the dog's no good or you're not doing it properly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, often it's just because the dog just can't deal with some things. And that's where the acceptance and the adaptations really help. And my husband and I, we had a dog like that ourselves, you know, who stayed with us for a, for a good well, 18 months, two years, really. We had to make a huge amount of adaptations and uh, you know, we did what we could for him, uh, given the limited kind of um, opportunities we had. And it's tough. But it just is that way sometimes. And actually, it re reduces a lot of stress. Once we, we have the three A's in human psychology, we, the first one is awareness. It's, 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 and that's our job, really, Nikki, I think, as professionals, mm -hmm. is to improve and support the awareness of a dog's care and support needs. Mm -hmm. The next A is acknowledgement. Uh, that person then they're now aware of it. And the same goes for physical stuff, being aware of physical pain. But then the next step is you have to acknowledge that. And that can be quite hard sometimes. It can be very difficult because of our own barriers and uh, we don't want to kind of, um, we, we can end up being in denial about things. And then the final A of course is acceptance. And that's the best place to be really. It's just accepting that situation. And it might not be forever, but it's where we're at. Uh, and um, uh, it takes a lot of stress away, I think, don't you think, if we can yeah. get to that point? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that's definitely the, the, the message. There's messages that I get of, they've got to that stage of accepting and the relief that comes with that is just huge you know letting go of that guilt and mm -hmm. feeling confident enough to take action and follow what their gut was telling them all along despite whatever pressures there may come from around them and there's another a actually that comes with awareness and that's advocacy Mm -hmm. I think once you are, when you know, the, the difficult bit often is the acknowledgement. That's the that's the tricky bit. It's painful. Uh, we, we can end up resenting a little bit at that point. But I think when we move to acceptance, then we advocate. And it, it's a different part of the brain. It changes everything, I think. You know, instead of, uh, you know, I had a situation, um, Arthur's my sensitive boy, guess what, he's a colleague. Uh, somebody came up behind us and, and just and, and stroked him and he he lost his whatever with him. Um, and the first thing I did was apologize to Arthur because uh, I'm at that point of advocacy for him. And actually I was quite angry at the person who just decided to come and touch my dog and he didn't want it. Yeah. Um, uh, yet when we're in the, before we go through that process, we're more likely to say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, you know, to, to, and apologize to the other, right? Yeah. Ace, we've covered loads of stuff. What a brilliant talk. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, some really great comments. Thank you for everybody. I've been having a little look um, whilst we've been talking. I'm not really good at doing multiple stuff. So I, I'm really in awe of people that I see do these Facebooks and they're doing everything. But <laughs> but I have been looking at some of the at some of the comments as well. And there's some really lovely stories there. And thank you for those that have shared. And I think this is the thing about being a bit vulnerable and, and also including our own stories in that, actually. Um, because... Um, many people it resonates with, and we're all kind of in the same boat. We're all trying to do the best we can with a species that, um, you know, uh, struggles to communicate needs sometimes. Well, actually, it doesn't it communicate needs very well. But we just struggle to the understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, where can people find more Nikki? We'll, uh, sure, we'll make sure we put the links in the in the thing yeah. Well. Yeah, my website probably will it will point you to wherever you need to get to. So it's just puptalk.co.uk or on it's in our pup talk. puptalk.co.uk. I love that. Um, easy. Pup talk. There you go. There you go, folks. That's the link. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You also have your podcast, uh, of course. Yeah, cunningly titled Pup Talk the Podcast. <laughs> That's right. As you said, I said I'm a simple girl. <laughs> simple. No, I like that. Uh, <laughs> Pep Talk the podcast and um uh that's gone a bit no certainly you've done really well with that yeah it's been yeah it's been good it pop, I only do it fortnightly because I have to say I do everything myself um so I record it edit it and put it out there so fortnightly is the, is the most I can manage on top of everything else so um it it, it bounces around in the pets and animal charts um <laughs> here and there um I've got a guest coming up fairly soon uh certainly you <laughs> yeah but yes I am um uh don't worry about that one but do check out the other ones but actually i've listened to a few uh nikki and uh, that's when we got talking at crafts actually 
um, because that's how I got to know you before anything else, we're basically the pub tour stuff. But um, the, uh, uh, and they're really accessible for caregivers. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like do you know, it, it was a lockdown idea and it came about because I'm actually really shy. I'm really shy about talking to people, especially talking to people I don't know. But what I found very early on when I was walking dogs, I'll quite happily stand and gas to anybody for quite a long period of time if the dogs are happy, if they have a dog. And we would just have, you, you just stop and chat with people and, you know, you'll just share some story. This is obviously not the dog reactive dogs that I'm walking. Um, and I just thought, well, if I can chat to anyone with a dog, well, surely I can just do a podcast version of that. So it's kind of that. It's it's stories. Um, it's professionals. It's anything that I think someone with a dog might find it interesting as a taster topic. So mm. I can talk about anything with anyone. So it might be the latest probiotic products it might be nutrition it might be behavioral stuff it might be grooming um lovely sue williams has been a guest um great um consent grooming podcasts um and some of them are just we, me wittering on about something that i'm doing with a client or something like that but it's a broad topic but just just to give caregivers a bit of a taster into something for them to go mm, actually i want to find out a little bit more about canny cross or whatever it is so yeah brilliant well excellent so Nikki, thank you very much. Um, uh, some great comments in the group here. Thank you for everybody who's coming along tonight. And uh, we've got the uh, wonderful Colin Spence for the next Facebook Live, which is next Monday, looking at um, the power of collaboration, Nikki. We don't talk about that enough as in our community, which has ended up being just so aggressively competitive, which is mm -hmm. a shame, really. I, don't, so I, never... I was surprised by that when I joined this industry. Mm. And look at and look at the world you came from, uh, you know, which is yeah. You'd think that would be even, even more development. tough, yeah. yeah. But, um, uh, uh, and that was the beautiful thing about Crofts, I think. Um, you know, I've got mixed feelings about Crofts, like we all do. But it was meeting people in person, just reminding ourselves that the majority of people in our industry are, are hardworking, compassionate, caring people. You just want to make a difference, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So Colin on Monday, uh, looking at that, and also positive representation in the in the community for for uh, BIPOC trainers. Uh, I think that's really important as well. So um, yeah, really important. Thanks again, Nikki. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Look after yourselves, and see you soon.